You actually, you mentioned a little bit earlier that merger and acquisition activity has um, increased. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Fed actually released a paper on this a little while ago. Um, Post-financial crisis, smaller banks have kind of been gobbled up by bigger banks. Um, do you have any insights onto why that's happening and like why that's continuing? Yeah, I mean, you know, the first is regulatory costs have gone up pretty dramatically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the banks that I own personally, which I mentioned earlier, is called Carter Bank and Trust. And Mr. Carter continues to run Carter Bank and Trust. And he has um, in his annual letters to shareholders has has various tirades that you can check out about how significantly the cost of regulation has gone up over the past few years. Um, obviously there are reasons why that cost has gone up and you know it's not Solely without merit, um, but when you, your fixed cost of doing business goes up, if you're a small company, a very first logical thing to do is to sell to try to spread that base, that cost base over a larger breadth of operations. So that's been driving some people to sell. Um, additionally, you know, as um, larger banks have needed more capital, um, particularly tier one capital, um, you know, the the low cost loyal deposit bases that community banks have start to look pretty attractive, mm-hmm. um, and so. You know, being able to buy those for you know um, ten, fifteen cents per deposit dollar um, can be a pretty good deal for some of those. And you've seen um, players like Bank uh, Umqua and some others try to go after regional rivals to to make their balance sheets a little bit bigger. And then you know, thirdly, like I said, it, having the scale um, in a what has been a pretty tepid economy for the last few years, um, being able to be a little bit more geog- geographically diversified, so you're not quite as tied. If you're Bank of Flint, Michigan, you're not. Just Bank of Flint, Michigan. Maybe you could be Bank of the entire Upper Midwest or something. You know that gives you more right. opportunities. Um, and you've also seen, just to sort of give more evidence of that point, a lot of uh, recent strategy for a lot of these smaller banks is to just open loan production offices in sort mm-hmm. of ma- larger cities. So, you know, Cascade Bank, which is in Bend, Oregon, has a loan production office in Portland now, and they want to open one in Sacramento. They're not going to take deposits in those markets, but they want to be able to make loans in those markets. Um, similarly. Suffolk Bank, which I mentioned earlier, has opened some loan production offices closer to New York City, obviously where the economy is a little bit more dynamic than it is out on the east end of Long Island. So I think I think the trend core towards consolidation um, will continue. Um, and that can be a good thing for investors because, generally speaking, something will get acquired at a premium to its market value. But, uh, you, you know, the 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 other idea here is that in the world of community banking, you know, there's still this idea of the gentleman banker. There are no hostile takeovers mm-hmm. in community banks. So, you know, Mr. Carter, for example, will probably have to make it known that he's interested in retiring before any offers will materialize for Carter Bank and Trust. Um, so it can be a little bit slow moving, even though that trend is certainly accelerating. That's really interesting. Um, I remember I remember reading about. I want to say it was. MNT Bank was trying to acquire uh, a smaller bank, I think, in Maryland, mm-hmm. um, and it, it ended up being a disaster for them. It took them five years because uh, there was money laundering happening at that bank, huh. and so the Fed, uh, the, the the federal government was like, "You have to make sure that this doesn't happen again." And the amount that they were laundering, it wasn't huge amounts. It wasn't like fifty thousand dollars. It was like. I don't know, like maybe like ten or something, which mm-hmm. I know sounds like a lot, but for banks, that's not a lot of money. Um, it, it's it's definitely an interesting proposition for larger banks. Well, yeah, sure. certainly you want to know what you're buying. Yeah, um, and that came out of the blue for yeah, them. Yeah, no, that, that and that's true. I mean, certainly, you, you'd hope internal controls at any bank are strong um, because bank failures, whether they're small or big, are, are uncomfortable for lots of different people involved. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, hostile. There, there are a couple of hedge funds that specialize in trying to do activist campaigns against um, small banks. Stillwell is one, for example, and you know, they, for example, um, make sure that whenever they try to be hostile or activist with a small bank, that um, there are no large insider shareholders or community shareholders because those people are very. It's very hard to get them to vote against. In the same way that they're loyal to the deposit base, they're loyal to the, the bank. And so, um, they spend a lot of time tactically um, finding votes, counting votes, figuring out how many shares they need to buy in order to actually exact change at an annual meeting. Um, so it, it is a chummy sector, which is kind of an interesting dynamic that you don't find in a lot of places in the stock market anymore. Yeah, definitely not. 